So we're going to begin this morning with Mike, and I'd like to ask him, what was your journey, and how did you get to writing this book and getting involved in the events surrounding Stephen Avery? Well, it's a long, uh, complicated story, uh, so I'll try to keep it simple, Melba, but thank you. Uh, I call it in the book a 20-year crime saga, because that's really what the Stephen Avery story is. Uh, before I get into it right away, I'd, I'd, I'm going to throw out there that I think there's basically three types of wrongful convictions on a broad, real broad brush. Some are, uh, they happen by mistake. They're what I'd call innocent wrongful convictions. Sounds funny, but I'm talking about the government action as being innocent, mistaken. Say it's a, a mistaken identification. Uh, something that the prosecutor and the police really didn't get and they believed with all their heart that the person they were charging and arguing guilt for a trial uh, was guilty. That would be what we hope to be most of them. Those happen. The next of the three types, I would say, are three different stripes that wrongful convictions come in. I think involved maybe overzealousness by the part of the state, whether it's the prosecutor uh, or the police, or both. Usually it's both if there's overzealousness. And maybe that kind of example would be, let's say, a uh, unreliable informant, jailhouse snitch, we call it. And let's say the prosecutor and the police push the person. They still think that the person they're charging is, is guilty, but they're pushing it. You know, they really have some doubts about the reliability of the informant themselves. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of that exculpatory evidence that maybe not quite so be so exculpatory in their minds, kind of, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder somewhat. Uh, so they don't release it. But in their hearts, they still think this guy's guilty. I'm going to do everything I can as an advocate for the people uh, to, to see that justice be done. And in that case, they believe firmly that justice is that the person be convicted. Not good. You know, if we let our advocacy, our zealousness sort of take over from our, our reason <coughs> and our uh, mercy might be too strong of a word, but our uh, kind of those words that you cited earlier, that minister of justice uh, part of uh, what we're here for. But then there's the third type. And the third type uh, goes beyond overzealousness. Uh, I think it's the kind of case that sort of shocks the conscience. Uh, police prosecutor misconduct. Um, the, the number they throw out there, the Innocence Project, is uh, cases that involve that. I think it's 47, something like that, percent of all wrongful convictions have a factor, not the factor, but a factor uh, being uh, governmental misconduct. Now, there's governmental misconduct and there's governmental misconduct. The Stephen Avery case, the one that happened in Wisconsin, in the very office where I'm now a prosecutor, uh, is one that shocks the conscience. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. You asked, you know, what was my journey to writing the book? Uh, you're not supposed to use obscenities in, in this kind of setting. I was pissed off. <laughs> Prosecutors always say that. But I was just very frustrated with what the, my former colleagues did. And before I make that kind of bald-faced statement, I just want to hit you with a few brief facts. I think we each get about 15 minutes. So I'll try to be quick. But the Avery story starts on June 29th, 1985. So it's coming up on uh, 30 years ago, 35, something like that. And uh, it, the assault, it began with this brutal, vicious assault of a woman jogging along the Lake Michigan shoreline uh, in Wisconsin. It's about the only time you can jog along the Lake Michigan shoreline, late summer. It's cold. Uh, and anyhow, she was a YMCA uh, physical fitness instructor. And one of her daily routines would be to run three miles up the lake shore and three miles back. And uh, it's a very isolated stretch of beach on Lake Michigan. And there was a fella uh, who was hiding basically behind a tree uh, close to the shore and lunged at Penny. Uh, Penny, I can use her name, she's the victim, she was very helpful in the book that I wrote. Um, 
as uh, and and when she was lunged at, she tried, of course, to escape. She angled off into the lake to avoid her attacker. She was afraid to jump in and swim uh, because she thought he'd grab her and, and, and drown her and strangle her. But he did. He got her as she came back toward the shore, and he grabbed her and took her up the sand dunes, and he just brutally, viciously attacked her. She survived. Uh, which is amazing in its own right, but she was able to uh, give an identification of her assailant. And this is where it starts to get, uh, at first it looks like it's pretty much a, a mistaken kind of wrongful conviction because the police uh, took a statement from her, she gave the description of her assailant, uh, and where it turns into sort of a bias situation is in a smaller community like, like where I come from, the county's only 70,000 people, so some of the folks know each other. Uh, the uh, assailant in this case was a well-known, or the person who they thought was assailant was a well-known person uh, among police. He had been involved in some other criminal activity. He was actually on bond at the time on bail for another offense. But the investigating officer almost immediately, based only on a very vague description of her assailant, thought, that sounds like Stephen Avery. And unfortunately, Stephen Avery was known to the investigating officer. Uh, he lived right across the street. And further, Stephen Avery's uncle uh, was a, sh a deputy in the sheriff's department. So the Avery family was sort of known. Now, this is a small community type thing, but the same sort of thing, if not knowing the people, the same kind of biases I think are relevant to larger offices that might start the police looking the wrong way. It moved on though to an identification process where they use the word unduly suggestive in the law. This went beyond unduly suggestive. Uh, the police had a mugshot of Stephen Avery brought up from his arrest prior to uh, the case. and. The folks who did the wrongful conviction lawsuit after the exoneration 18 years later are convinced that the mugshot of Stephen Avery was basically looked at by the uh, police artist sketch, and then the artist sketch became the mugshot. So in a sense, they had their suspect working with the victim. They developed uh, this artist sketch that looked in the words of the trial court judge, had an uncanny resemblance with the mugshot. So already it looks like police are, are getting toward a situation where they know who it is and they're manipulating the evidence, kind of the opposite of what police and prosecutors are supposed to do. So it goes to trial, the case goes to trial, and despite 16 alibi witnesses and a time slip, a receipt from a Shopko, a department store in Green Bay, uh, that showed it was virtually impossible for Mr. Avery to have committed the crime, the jury convicted Mr. Avery. And again, that sort of bias that even goes beyond the prosecutor, but to a community, started to take effect because uh, Penny Burnson, the victim in this case, and her husband Tom were business people. She was an extremely articulate, wonderful woman. Uh, she, the prosecutor, routinely went through the attack. It wasn't an issue of uh, how brutal the attack was. The charge was attempted homicide, sexual assault, false imprisonment. So the need to sort of prove the crime wasn't there so much. It was who did it. But the whole trial basically was Penny's identification and over and over again, kind of her recounting through witness statements to the police earlier and through her own statement to the jury, a reenactment with her husband. Um, of the crime, very odd in my opinion how it came off. Uh, so that's the issue in, in, my, in my opinion about how we as prosecutors sometimes we can use sympathy, we can use emotion to some extent, that's valid uh, since uh, we are advocates, but we can go overboard. Uh, and in this case we went overboard. So far no no, no real misconduct. I started my my comments with my misconduct, uh, and with with prosecutorial or police misconduct. I don't think it's there yet. But soon this case developed into something where it was different. The police uh, 
Penny Bernson went to the police shortly after he was arrested, Mr. Avery, and there were several phone calls made to her late at night, uh, by which is often done by assailants when they know their victim. And she thought this was the assailant. Couldn't have happened. Couldn't have been Mr. Avery though, because he was in locked in, in jail, awaiting trial on bail, uh, with no access to a phone at that point. Penny Bernson goes to the police. And she says, look, I think it might be somebody else. And worse, the police agency, the city police agency, a larger police agency, goes with Penny, a detective, to the sheriff and says, look, I think you really got the wrong guy. We've been tracking this other person, Gregory Allen, who matches the description much better. I think he's the guy that did it. The case goes on, it goes to trial. Staff in the district attorney's office actually go up to the DA who is prosecuting the case. Look, he looks, we've seen this Gregory Allen guy in trial. He looks like the assailant. Not only that, Gregory Allen, the true assailant, had attacked brutally a separate woman on the same stretch of beach, roughly, with the same kind of MO, and including calling the victim after him. Uh, one year earlier, almost to the day, and the same prosecutor who went after Mr. Avery had prosecuted Mr. Allen, the true assailant. I found that case, the com criminal complaint and the police reports in the Avery file when the wrongful conviction came out years later. So that showed, I believe, that the uh, prosecutor at the time knew who the correct person was, somebody two years prior, and uh, prosecuted the person, uh, a person who was only a vague match of the description and in many ways did not at all fit uh, the description of the true assailant. Uh, the staff went to the DA at the time and the DNA said, no, it can't be this other person I prosecuted two years uh, earlier because, or one year earlier because he's on probation. I called the probation agent and the probation agent said there's no way he could have did it, done it. He has an airtight alibi. I checked. He was in some other city. Well, it turns out in the Attorney General's investigation after we took it there 18 years later, after Mr. Avery served all that time, that Mr. Allen, the true assailant, wasn't even on probation. So the DA had told the staff, it can't be that assailant. He's on probation. Well, the fact is he wasn't even on probation. Uh, my time is short, so it's hard to sort of explain what else is there to show that this is one of those wrongful convictions that sort of shock the conscience. Um, but it is. And uh, at least I think a, a large number of people think it is. I came into the story when DNA evidence showed through the Wisconsin Innocence Project. I'm on the board there, funny a prosecutor being on the board of the Innocence Project, but uh, it shouldn't be funny, it should be, it should be common. Uh, but uh, the DNA evidence came back and showed there was no question that this other person who the other police agency thought did the assault and who the DA involved prosecuted for a similar assault, or a failed assault, he lunged at his victim, uh, that that was the true uh, assailant. The DNA came back to him, and we swiftly joined with defense counsel, the Wisconsin Innocence Project, and made sure that Mr. Avery was released uh, forthwith from prison. Uh, as Orson Welles once said, if you want a happy ending uh, of a story, it depends on where you stop the story. Unfortunately, the Stephen Avery story didn't stop with Mr. Avery's exoneration. Two years after he was released, and after he became a kind of a folk hero in Wisconsin, and the namesake for the Avery Task Force criminal justice reform bill, after meeting with the governor, uh, on the very day the governor was set to sign uh, the Avery bill with a $36 million wrongful conviction lawsuit going well, Mr. Avery was arrested uh, for the brutal, brutal homicide of a young freelance photographer named Teresa Halbach, who had been missing for three days. Uh, the trial on the murder case two years later interconnected uh, the original case because, of course, the only defense was, because there was physical evidence this time, was the police, upset about that wrongful conviction a action, were up to it again. 
Mr. Avery started the defense by calling in live to Nancy Gray's show and saying they're up to it again, they're setting me up, there was evidence of, uh, uh, there was a defense of evidence planting from the first case that they took the blood from the wrongful conviction file 18 years earlier and put some on the victim's car uh, and other evidence as well. So I explained it was a complicated story at first. It is a complicated story. I hope I at least brought the basics to you and uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Mel. And just to wrap up that, what was the outcome of the, the murder case? The jury was out for uh, two days. They seriously considered the frame-up evidence that the police once again wrongly convicted uh, went after somebody. Uh, but after that two-day uh, uh, deliberations, the jury did find Mr. Avery guilty. Uh, 